Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this um, case discussion course for FRCS exams. Uh, some of you have attended our courses before as participants or observers, but for those who are new, uh, we will cover all exam stations today, Viva and clinical stations, one hour per station. It will be an intensive day. We will end, we'll aim to end around uh, to finish today at five o'clock, and there will be lunch break um, just after one. This is a faculty. We have top faculty today. Are very experienced in providing exam specific um, education uh, for the FRCS, and they've um, been taking part in these courses for a very long time. They're very experienced. I encourage you guys to make the best out of their experience today. So we'll have today, um, we have today as six participants um, and each participant will be examined on each station and you'll be given feedback. Um, please listen carefully to the feedback you're given. Um, we won't share the slides, the slides, unfortunately. So if you want to take notes or take a screenshot, please do. And I want to emphasize that today we are not, we're not aiming to teach you everything about orthopedics, but to focus your revision and to focus your technique on how to improve your scores and how to score higher. What are the buzzwords to use? What are the phrases to use? The keynotes, uh, the key phrases, the key principles that you need to discuss in your answers, yeah? We will uh, encourage uh, interaction. We encourage you to ask us questions, but we will have to keep it FRCS specific. So if there is any question that goes up above and beyond the curriculum or then they will, we will have to skip that, yeah? But otherwise, everything that FRCS is relevant, we will answer for you. We'll ask you uh, guys, please respect uh, the faculty today and respect each other and make sure you allow time for each one to take their own time and speak uh, and get their feedback. As I said, please write down the questions, write down the feedback you're given. Um, so mainly we are here today, as I said, to, to help you improve your score in the exam. Okay, so improve your technique, uh, how you answer the questions, what are the key topics. So today we will be discussing in, in our stations, in our seven stations, we're discussing all the, uh, we were discussing about 42 high yield um, exam specific questions. It's guaranteed that one of, you will get some of these questions definitely in your exams. Um, so, you know, the concepts will always be the same and will, will, will help you to, to to answer these the best of your abilities. So for, I'm going to assume today that no one is going for their exams tomorrow. 
if anyone is going for the exam tomorrow, let us know, but I don't think any of you is. If any of you is going for exam tomorrow, let us know. Uh, but I don't think um, any of you is. Uh, so please guys, uh, uh, come back um, and join us in our future events and future courses. Uh, we run webinars as well. So uh, our other successful course has been the basic sciences course. Uh, we have next one on the 19th of March. We run one last week and um, it went very well. We had very positive feedback from that one. It was very popular. So um, in the basic sciences course, we cover also the so same like today, but the whole day just dedicated to basic sciences, covering all aspects of it. So, um, okay, guys, we were here to help, help you and support you. If there are any issues at all, any questions, anything not clear, we don't leave today until it's all clear, yeah? We can have a chat in the breaks. We can have a chat in lunchtime or after the course or during the course. So please don't leave today until you are happy that all your questions have been answered and everything is clear. But we'll have to stick to the FRCS, FRCS level discussions. Yeah, know where the wonderful stuff. Great, so without further ado, I'll hand over now to David. David um, is one of the founders of Orthopedic Academy. He's very keen educator and he's, um, we're very privileged to have him with us in the, today. He's gonna start kick off this course with the basic sciences section. Yeah. And we will go through guys, we've, we've named you uh, pre participant one to participant uh, five while we are waiting for participant six to join. Um, so, okay, David, if you're happy to start. So the first participant is uh, Thomas, who's the keenest of you all. We, he's the first one to join today. Okay. So, um, all right. Um, morning, Thomas. I think, uh, uh, you were around last, uh, a couple of weeks back with the basic science, weren't you? Uh, I did one of the webinars here. Okay. Good. So first question. Can you tell me what's happening in this x-ray? Uh, yeah, this is um, x-ray showing radial longitudinal uh, deficiency of the forearm um, with radial deviation of the hand. Um, so this uh, is um, <clears throat> a failure of uh, formation uh, as classified okay. by Swanson. Um, the limber develops in the fourth to sixth week of life um, and its regulation is uh, regulated by a few uh, different zones. Um, so radio ulnar differentiation uh, is regulated by the zone of polarizing activity, which is on the ulnar side of the limb bud, uh, and it, uh, expression of the sonic hedgehog uh, protein regulates uh, ulnar to radial uh, growth. So this is a def deficiency in that uh, uh, protein. Okay. So. Lots of, uh, so you've talked about those seven steps. So can you tell me a bit about the formation of joints? Um, so joints um, are formed by uh, apoptosis uh, of uh, segments uh, within the within the limb. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know much more about it than that. Okay. So sometimes you can get things where the fingers might not separate. What happens when you have finger separation? How, what causes that? Uh, so uh, syndactically, it's caused by, if, um, so it, normally there's controlled apopt uh, apoptosis between the digits. Um, so this is a failure of that uh, apoptosis. Okay. And do you know anything about limb patterning? Limb patterning. Uh, I'm not sure what, what the, the meaning of that, sorry. Okay, so when we talk about embryology, there's a special sort of diagram we can sort of, we can produce. Can you describe it to me? Do you mean the uh, limber development or, yeah, so um, limber development, uh, the limber develops as I said between four to six uh, weeks. There's an apical ectodermal ridge uh, which uh, regulates uh, longitudinal growth, usually fibrous growth factor. Um, then there's a zone of polarizing 
activity on the ulna side, which does ulna to radial growth, the sonic hedgehog, and then dorsal uh, ventral growth is controlled by the WNT uh, pathway. Okay. Well, I think we've probably about exhausted you there, haven't we, Thomas? It's a, it's a difficult one to start with, isn't it? Yeah. So should we sort of go through this, sort of go through that? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so if in the, if in the exam when you have this, you should try and hopefully produce something along these lines. So it, the key thing yeah. is they're talking about. You're quite right. Limb bud development. And you got back very quickly. So what's sort of gone wrong in utero? So we had a radial club hand there, and we're talking about um, sort of the limb bud. So we got the uh, progress zone, apical ectodermal ridge, the ventral dorsal, and obviously. You have to be able to work out um, in terms of what's anterior, what's posterior, what's proximal and distal. Zona polar, uh, zona, uh, I can never say it myself. Zona polarization. Mesenchymal, uh, so making a thumb, making a pinky. So you're quite right, you said you've got your radial and your ulnar side um, and, the, and the sonic the hedgehog. So key things sort of in terms of the, um, the ge genetic codes, all right? So yeah, you're quite right. It starts around four to six weeks. It's limb bud is uh, controlled by FGF, which is top of my head, um, fibroblast growth, growth factor, um, apioptectal ridge, obviously not a cord to suppress, expresses the sonic hedgehog, and that regulates the formation of the limb bud and grows outwards in terms of the ectodermal apical ridge. And it's roughly sort of 26 days after fertilization, hence the four to six weeks. Now, I mean, in terms of limb patterning, we talk about proximal to distal on the, on the apical, apical, the, uh, apical ectodermal ridge and anterior posterior in terms of the zone of polarizing activity and dorsal ventral, so non apical uh, non AR limb ectoderm. So I think that's what we're sort of talking about. And you're quite right with finger separation, digital rays are evident in the hand, a hand paddle around 41 days, and there's programmed cell death, and that's regulated by the Hox gene. Okay. Well, those are sort of, embryology is really difficult, to be honest. Um, um, no one's going to be, uh, no one's going to be a world expert on it. So it's going to be someone who is um, uh, sort, of, sort of a consultant who remembers doing it when, when they're studying for their exam. And so they will have the mark sheet in front of them. So these are sort of the key sort of things that they want you to be saying. But as I say, to be honest, if you can get this drawing out and talk about it as your drawing, you're going to be doing really well and you're going to pass that station properly. Okay. And then it's talking about in terms of um, uh, sort of learning, in terms of getting a higher mark, we we want you to describe why they want you to describe why you've had so, the radio club hand. Okay. And so that's a failure on the um, on the on the on this side on the sorry, excuse me, time is going off. On, on the sort of radial side, as you quite rightly said, okay? And that sort of thing in terms of, uh, the key thing of any sort of basic science topic is in terms of clinical application. So if you can apply it in the clinical situation, they're gonna be happy, they're gonna be, they're going to be positive towards you, okay? Uh, any sort of questions, Thomas? You asked about the, how joints are formed. What was yeah, that? I can have a buddy remember myself. Um, So there we go. So, I'll... so the formation of joints requires a repression of chondrogenesis. So you still have that growing sort of limb, but it's that repression in the, in the middle that allows the joint to form. You see what I mean? Okay. We're on to the next one. Okay, who's number two? Uh, I am. Hi. Hello. Hi. Okay, so we've got an 18 month year old child who's crying and not moving their right arm. Can you tell me what this shows? This is a clinical radiograph of an uh, uh, immature uh, 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 person showing an elbow, mm -hmm. uh, right elbow, according to that. Uh, there seems to be a, a postural uh, medial uh, sort of a dislocation but then again this is an immature uh, 18 months old so it uh, there's a high likelihood of uh, uh, physical uh, injury uh, to this uh, patient uh, mm -hmm. and uh, i'll be concerned about uh, um, a non-accidental injury in this uh, assuming uh, that has ruled out 
I would approach this patient and uh, do the uh, take the history. I would like to know uh, what exactly happened, and uh, uh, the history um, uh, with not moving arm for how long? Uh, the patient is uh, not moving the arm. Is there any associated uh, injury with that, uh, or if uh, the deformity is there for a long time? Um, and uh, I'll document the, uh, the clinical examination. I would like to see uh, the deformity. I will uh, um, document the uh, vascular status uh, as well as uh, see if the child is moving the fingers and hand. Um, and, uh, um, and then I would... Uh, um, 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 one, one okay, final. I'll give you a bit of history. So... The child fell off um, a chair, a high chair, um, and the parents seem to be, you know, um, telling you the right story and they're very worried. Um, and it happened about six hours before you see them. There's no other significant medical history and you're not worried about non-accidental injury in this particular case. But I appreciate that these injuries can be associated with non-accidental injury. So um, he's neurovascularly intact um, and he's got a deformed elbow. So tell me what you're going to do next. So um, I, I would, uh, um, uh, if, uh, during the daytime, I would uh, take uh, uh, appropriately prep this patient and uh, 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 take this patient to theatres. <laughs> uh, uh, in an appropriately marked and consented patient, I would uh, um, put him on uh, uh, an anesthesia um, uh, with arm uh, uh, extra control. I would uh, uh, see if I'm able to uh, correct uh, uh, um, uh, the deformity. Uh, I would like to use uh, an omnipec injection on table uh, to delineate the um, uh, epiphysis of this uh, uh, elbow. Uh, and uh, most of the time, uh, they tend to uh, reduce by manipulation only, and we don't need to open up the, uh, the joint, but um, uh, I'll, I'll be guided by my um, um, uh, intra-articular um, arthrogram to see. Um, uh, okay. All right, so we, you reduce it and you check it with the arthrogram and it's reduced. What do you do afterwards? So if it, if it's reduced and I will I will screen it and I'll see if it's a, 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 it is click back I'll I'll, I'll feel for that but uh, I would uh, tend to put uh, uh, two uh, ky uh, uh, small ky uh, um, um, on the lateral aspect um, uh, 1.2 millimeter this is an 18 month old child um, um, and then um, confirm my uh, position and then uh, put him into a, an above elbow back slab. Okay. Are you aware of any techniques when putting KYs across the growth plate? So, yeah, so from one side, uh, the KYs should cross outside the, uh, um, um, the skin uh, and they should be divergent. Um, and... Uh, um, um, what about the actual, so the, the nurse gives you a threaded K-wire from the distal radius set? Would you? So, uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, I, I would like to use the threaded K-wires, yes. Uh, uh, I'll be happy with that. Uh, uh, okay. And the, which has the, 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 just the threaded at the end, isn't it? So. Yeah. Because I'm going through the lateral aspect. Um, I would, uh, I will, I will not go through the other cortex. I will just uh, uh, stay inside the cortex. Uh. Okay. All right. Good. How do you think you did? Um, I think I, initially I wasn't sure where where it's going to go. Um, uh, to be honest, uh, and I'm not sure. Still not sure whether I gave the right answer or not. Um, um, I think you did well. I think you did well. Okay. Um. I would tend to use smooth K wires going across the growth plate. And the other okay. thing is you want to do a single pass. You don't want to be doing multiple passes. Yeah, That's yeah. any other thing. All right, let's have a look at the answers. So you were correct. When you initially said dislocation, I thought, oh, we're going to go down that route, are we? But then you brought, came back and thought of this. So well done. 
Um, it's getting harder and harder for me to trick people with this question these days. Everybody knows it. Um, and the point is, as you said, it's a distal physeal humeral separation. Um, <clears throat> young children. And it is one of those injuries that can be associated with non-accidental injury. But that's not where my question was going for this one. But so you were right to bring it up early and exclude it. <clears throat> that's why I gave you the information that, you know, we're not going to go down that route. Um, yeah, so fractures young children under three, fall on the outstretched hand. You can have it in rotational um, forces. All right, evaluation, suspect abuse, which you did. Examination, which you did. Crepitus, I, I, you know, I, I don't think many of us would start moving people's elbows that looked like that to try and elicit crepitus. I think it would be too painful. <clears throat> Neurovascular examination, usually normal x-rays. Um, you can use ultrasound, you can use MRI, but I don't think we need to. As you said, I would do what you did, which is take them to theatre and use some Omnipake to identify the joint and make sure it's reduced. Um, Proscopy arthrogram, you said, KY is if it's unstable and you really, really need to do an open reduction. Complications, anything that injures the pediatric growth plate at the elbow can cause varus, cubitus varus, cubitus valgus. Missing the diagnosis is the other thing. Um, <clears throat> and you can have some growth disturbance. So I think that's it for that one. Yeah, it is. Is there any questions about this one? Just a quick question: Is um, bending yeah. um, closed uh, bending under image or, or uh, K wire? Is it either the three or two in lateral from lateral medial or cross similar exactly like supracondylar or has a specific one? Um, potentially, you could do either. I mean, obviously, if you're going to do a medial, remember to say you do a mini open, identify the ulnar nerve, and move it out of the way. Most of these will be stable after just a closed reduction, but you can put in a couple of K wires from the lateral side um, <clears throat> just to hold it. It's not, you haven't got the same kind of rotational um, instability that you have with a supercondylar fracture. Um, and the child tends to be a little bit younger. So provided you can get a reduction um, <clears throat> and check it with the um, arthrogram, then the chances are it's going to heal. I mean, the, the kids are young, you know, so they're going to heal really quickly. <clears throat> so if you are going to use KYs in this, I would use one or two smooth KYs, single pass, and it's literally only just to hold it in place um, back once you've reduced it. And usually we utilize arthrogram to confirm reduction or it depends on how in, in theater? Um, you can use it to confirm your reduction, or if you were unsure about whether this was an elbow dislocation or um, a physeal separation, you could do an arthrogram in theatre. So you can use it kind of diagnostic to check that you've got your diagnosis right, um, and also to confirm that you've got a reduction. Thank it's you. similar, you know, if you have a, a lateral condyle fracture, um, that, you know, it's, there's a big cartilaginous component to it and you're not sure you've got it reduced or not, you can do an arthrogram there and you can see the outline to make sure you've got your reduction. Thank okay. you. All right. Would, so, would, there, would there be any question like, how do you do uh, arthrogram for the elbow? Um, something like that? Or what um, yes. Yes, they could ask you that. Um, I've not been asked that in England. For Islam, I was asked that in the Australian exams about what the, um, how you mix up the Omnipeg, what percentage you use, what you mix it with, where you inject it. Um, and I can't remember it off the top of my head now, um, but look it up because I, if they yeah. ask it in the Australian exam, and the thing is, if you're going to do it in theatre, there's no reason why they can't ask you in because the exam. In, the, uh, in, in, in this uh, distal humeral uh, epiphyseal separation the anatomy would be distorted so like normally if you have to f feel the anconius uh, triangle and then inject through there it would be distorted isn't it so how do you kind of see 
injected diaper. Well, you've got fluoros you've got an asleep patient and you've got fluoroscopy. Okay. So you can see, and obviously you don't get a syringe of 20 mils of omnipake and yes. bang it all in. You're gonna <laughs> screen the elbow, see if you've got it reduced, and okay. then follow where your needle is gonna go. Maybe inject a little bit and check where it's going. I think there is another uh, uh, a safe way also to target the posterior uh, the olecranon fossa from the back, and it should be fifty saline, fifty iodine uh, material or um, contrast. Yeah, fifty. Yeah, and then it's I think it's similar. You know, when you do an arthrogram for DDH, and you kind of inject a little bit <clears throat> and then screen it to see if you're actually in the joint. Yeah. Um. And, and that would be reasonable to do, I think. Yeah. Can I um, come yeah. in here? Thank you, Nikki. Um, perfect explanation. Uh, guys, for the exams, you don't really worry about, you're not going to ask you how much you're going to inject in the elbow. Uh, just, uh, you know, they will tell you, you know, how much you're going to inject in the elbow a child. You just throw any number. It could say one mil. And I, I will see if it's adequate. If not, adequate, I give another mil. Just as simple, keep it simple. They're not going, you're not a pediatric or, you know, surgeon who knows all about um, injecting joints with contrast, stuff like that. And just keep it simple, guys. They're not going to dig you into how much, how many males they're going to inject in it. How much, you know, how many males can you give in a, a child's elbow? Um, and, or what's the technique of using it? It's just not really an exam. Uh, you know, the technique is, is just putting, you know, in the soft spot on the triangle and put a needle and could give some injection. Um, so they want more, comp you know, they want more interesting concepts to test you on. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, um, so uh, there was one um, a question about the size of, of, of the wires. And obviously for supracondylar is two millimeters, but um, according to Bolst. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I that's a reasonable answer, but yeah. I don't think you need to go as big as two millimeters um, because it's not the same no, rotational no. instability. So you can go with the 1.25. You know, it depends on the size of the child as well, but these are kind of like, really young children yeah 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 i think um yeah i think that's that that's very reasonable i think yeah supraconda fractured kids are older um and and uh, elan wanted to clarification of of um of how, how do you know it's not show and it's not elbow dislocation just uh, go over that again if you just quickly for us nikki um well the key is that you need to think of it because you can't see the um you can't see the cartilage you're going to see this um and so you have to think, okay, in this age group with this x-ray appearance, is it truly a dislocation or is it this distal physeal humeral separation? Um, <clears throat> it's difficult. It's difficult, but you have to have a high index of suspicion. And if you are unsure, that's why you do the arthrogram and screen in theater. Um, because it does look like, sorry, it does look like an elbow dislocation. So that's why yeah. I put it in here so that you are aware of it. Yeah. Uh, Nikki, can you put the x-rays back up, please, uh, that you had, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine, that's great, thank you. Okay. So it does look like a dislocation, it does, well, but- it can, it, can, it can be a dislocation, but you, but, um, um and that's why it's it's difficult you've got to assume the worst it's not gonna be and you know an exam not gonna be dislocation let's let's be uh, realistic about it they're not gonna ask you about elbow dislocation in a child in the exam no yeah. they're gonna ask so, something like this so that's what what we are here for 
it's to be realistic of what we expect in the exam, they're gonna ask you about this human physical separation, not about elbow dislocation in a child. Um, there's nothing much to talk about it then. They could get elbow dislocation in adults, maybe terrible triad. There's more interesting mm -hmm. stuff to talk about. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's difficult. Yeah, and the dislocation, the relationship between radius and Allah is more distorted and stuff like this. It might look different, but you know, sometimes it's difficult to be sure. I mean, you could argue, you could argue that the relationship between the radius and ulna is more or less um, normal, but you can't really tell. I mean, you know, if you look at that, you could say, okay, well, maybe because these are relatively in the right position because your distal humeral physis has gone with the radius and ulna. But I just think it's too hard to say yeah, that yeah. based on the x-rays alone. I know. It's only theoretical, isn't it, Nikki? Mm. Just theoretical. That's, uh, but you can never be sure. You can never be hundred percent sure. Yeah. So it will be fair in the exam to to say I want to rule out this location. Absolutely, absolutely. But but I can tell you that the, the the discussion is not going that direction. There's nothing much to discuss there for a child. No, and if you get this in exam in an exam, you will probably be going down the route of non-accidental injury. Yeah, I haven't gone down that route because I'm going down that route soon. But for this case, if you get this in an exam, it probably will go that way. That's a very good case. Thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, sorry, can I ask a question? Uh, very good questions. Yeah. Yes, please, oh, Baba. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I, my understanding was that this age group, uh, like less than two years, uh, you tend to have more so, uh, if at all, like a radial uh, head dislocation rather than a elbow dislocation. Is it common to have an elbow dislocation at this age? Because my understanding was it would be either, you know, when I said, oh, no, because an arthritic is 18 months, it may so, be. Uh, what's the, tell us, Baba, what's the... Um... It's, it's a reasonable question, but what exactly are you trying to get from that question? So we know to answer you. We're, so my, we're my, not discussing my, what's my, more common here. Yeah, but mm -hmm. my, my understanding was the uh, 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 elbow dislocation in a child is at least more than two to three years old. I've never seen an elbow or heard of an elbow dislocation. It's more like a radial head dislocation. Well, in, yeah, it might be correct. You might be correct. But I think in the exam, you have to mention that I would, would want to make, that can be an elbow dislocation. But it's yeah. most likely to be a distal humerus. You won't go wrong with that, yeah. I mean, I mean, if you told me this was a radial head dislocation, I wouldn't be happy. No, I know that. That's the reason. Yeah. I, I, so, Barbara, yeah. uh, if you see the incongruency, it is both an radiocapitular and elnohumeral joint, isn't it? So, if it was just a radial head dislocation, the in other joint wouldn't be incongruent. In a okay. child, well, epiphysis is not visible. A supracondylar fracture looks like this. It's a good answer, rather than. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, and the thing is, it's unlikely that you're going to get a radial head dislocation in the exam because there's nothing to talk about. Yeah. You know, this is something that they need you to know because it is one of those cases that could be a marker for child abuse. So they want to know that you are not going to miss this. So put radial head fracture in the back of your head and go with the distal humeral physical separation and differential of elbow dislocation, and then you won't go wrong. Okay? Okay. Shall we move on? Brilliant, brilliant. Now to Golam, he's the third candidate. Hello. Hi, Gulam. How are you? Hello. Man? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Fala. Good, good. Oh, sorry. No, no, it's okay. I understand. Yes, good. Hmm. So, Gulam. Yes. Look at the picture. Yes. What can you see? So, this is a clinical photograph of the hand. They are good to stitching the, the radial border. They, I think they are doing just for the Decorvan disease. Okay. You think this is Decorvan's disease? 
It could be yes. Duke Rwanda disease or could be the lateral epicondylitis. Test. So you think this is decorons or lateral epicondylitis? Decoron. De okay, that's fine. So decorons disease is what is decorons disease? Decorons de de disease is a de degeneration uh, of the sheath of the first compartment of the, uh, of the dorsal of the wrist, which is the abductor pollicis longus and uh, extensor pollicis previous. And this uh, sheath, sheath become uh, uh, thick and in, inflamed and then causes uh, pain uh, just above the radial side of the wrist. And right, so you, how are you going to examine this patient? Um, the exam examination is uh, first with the history and uh, then when we examining there will be some uh, uh, tenderness uh, ab ab about the radial stylite and uh, and also there will be some uh, crepitus sometimes and some readiness will be there and also by putting the ulnar deviation of the wrist it will be painful. So ulnar deviation of this doesn't cause pain. So the ulnar deviation doesn't cause pain, okay. No. Okay. You want to do anything else with ulnar deviation? Uh, yes, the ulnar, uh, the, to, 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 um, uh, the, I, I can put the thumb inside the, um, the, the palm. Uh, and then I will do the ulnar deviation. So he got pain with that, lot of pain with this maneuver. So generally speaking, if the patient is getting a radial sided wrist pain, what can be the causes? Uh, the, the cause uh, can, can be multiple of the radial. I mean, uh, uh, I need to, 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 to take the history and examine and rule out there is a, any fracture of the um, of the stylite process of the radius or any skewfoid fracture or trapezoid or there is osteoarthritis. Uh, and also there is a, a, a transition symptom is uh, 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 syndrome is also on the radial side. What is transaction syndrome? The transaction syndrome is that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the 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 ex extensor pollicis uh, longus uh, um, is crossing over the um, e e extensor carpi radialis longus in previous. Uh, and this is transaction. And what also, is uh, Wartenberg syndrome? Wartenberg syndrome is that the superficial radial nerve is coming uh, between these muscles, uh, which uh, the, they are uh, crossing. Um, and the rest, uh, like uh, extensor, uh, extensor carpi radialis longus in previous, with extensor uh, pollicis previous. And there are superficial radial nerves comes inside and it's painful. All right, okay. Well, so we'll go to decorons disease, okay. Yes. You said it is uh, entrapment tenopathy. In which yes. the sclerose thick come, uh, curtain on which is pressing the tendon, isn't it? Yes. So, what tendons lie there? The tendon is the first compartment uh, tendons, which are the abductor pollicis uh, longus as well as the uh, extensor pollicis previous. And which is where? Which is more volar? Uh, the the, the bo bo both tendons are uh, on the radial side and dorsum and uh, the extensor pollicis previous is more uh, in the, towards the middle, um, which is more dorsal uh, than the radial, but the abductor is more radial. Okay, so this is the first dorsal compartment, isn't it? Yes. So how many compartments are there total? Uh, there, there are six. The second one is the... Uh, the extensor carpi radialis longus in previous, and the third car, uh, compartment is the extensor pollicis longus, 
And the fourth one is the extensor digitorum uh, and uh, also extensor in indices. And uh, the, the fifth is the, the extensor carpi alnaris. Uh, and the sixth one is the uh, extensor digiti mini. The fifth one is extensor digiti minimi, and the sixth one is the extensor carpi alnaris. All right, okay. That's fine. So you diagnose this as a, uh, as a Dick Warren's disease, okay? Yes. And you, you're given steroid, which worked for six months, but he come at a, one and a half years with repeated symptoms, and you think that shit is white shit, and you're taking for decompression. Patient is consented, marked, and prepared. How are you going to do decompression? Uh, decompression is, uh, uh, I, will, I, will, I will explain to the patient is markedly consented, as you said, and the patient will be supine on the arm board and uh, with a tourniquet, uh, eye tourniquet. And then uh, I will, my, my landmark is the, um, uh, the, the stylite process of the radius. Uh, and just about that and the more superficial uh, tendon and swelling part, I will make a longitudinal incision. I will do very clear, uh, very, very careful dissection to avoid entry to the superficial branch of the radial nerve. And uh, once I reach through the tendons, I will just uh, release the capsule and make sure the tendons are not injured. So when you're doing this, you felt that there is too much bleeding, profuse bleeding, pulsatile bleeding. What might be problem? Mm. This, if it's uh, bleeding, so the radial, uh, radial artery is a uh, waller to that. And uh, I should be careful to, to not to injure and uh, um, or maybe some some branches of the radial artery which is um, coming to, towards the snuff box mm -hmm. so i will try to cut cut it what can be the complication of this procedure the complication are uh, can be infection and can be bleeding and uh, it uh, can be recurrence of this one and uh, can be complex regional pain syndrome so you said it can recur, isn't it? You released it. So why should it recur? Is there a reason why it does the, does the... Yeah, the reason is that it's, it's uh, in spite of its uh, release, the, the capsule can uh, be regenerated again. And the, uh, sorry, the synovial sheet can be regenerated again and can be formed. So they will make a synovial so sheet. So you again. said that retinaculum will be formed again, isn't it? Yes. Can it be any other reason? Yeah, the, the, the other is a scar, scar tissue can be there and also neuroma from the uh, superficial radial nerve is the other. That's fine. Of, okay. So uh, I'll give you an answer and then we'll yeah. talk about it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the picture shows uh, a Finkelstein test, the history of D cover one synovitis. All right? Yes. So in Finkelstein test, you, you grasp the thumb and ulnar deviate, and you get excruciating pain. Yes. One of modification or uh, variant is called Eichhoff maneuver, in which you release the thumb and allow it to extend and pain goes away. Okay. So it's important that you grasp them. So it is a, it is a, um, in this condition, there is an entrapment of the first dorsal compartment tendons. Okay. Isn't it? Yes. Which are extensor policies and uh, extensor, uh, sorry, extensor policies, brevis and uh, abductor policies. Abductor policies lies volar to the extensor policies brevis, okay? Okay. So what can be the causes of the radial wrist pain? Okay. Uh, it can be decorvance uh, synovitis. Okay. Other type of, uh, uh, it can be intersection syndrome. Okay. It can be Wartenberg's um, syndrome, which is uh, uh, pinching of the superfluid branch by brachial radialis and extensor carpal radialis um, longus. 
it can be something as you mentioned earlier it can be trauma causing radial steroid or scaphoid fracture it can be arthritis in the wrist or in the uh, a cmc joint some sort of arthritis can affect only radial steroid yes it can be neuroma isn't it Radi neuroma of radial um, superficial branch of radial nerve okay and sometimes fcr tendinosis these are all the causes of radial sided wrist pain so yes. pathology as we discuss is a physically entrapment tendinopathy in which there is thickening of retina column there are certain causes like um, uh, it's more common in women with repeated trauma and it's it is it got a uh, quite coincidence with the postpartum just immediately yeah. after delivery you can get it commonly you answered the dorsal compartments right okay and you described decompression so basically you can take uh, people take uh, i would in consented marked and prepared patient you can either take a dorsal uh, dorsal dorsal radial transverse or linear incision okay and then you expose the extensor retinaculum of first dorsal compartment and release it okay it can be done under local anesthesia or general anesthesia okay one of the important thing is that sometimes the extensor uh, pulsis brevis has a separate compartment so there are two compartments in the one compartment mm. and that is one of the cause of recurrence yes okay like in carpal tunnel syndrome uh, the proximal release is in adequate and is a it's common cause of uh, recurrence this is common cause of recurrence in this case so what can be the risks this can be injury to structures like uh, radial artery superficial branch of radial nerve okay which can in turn form neuroma okay there's a risk of infection there can be a risk of um, uh, recurrence of symptom yes all right yes and as you said uh, regional uh, pain syndrome so mm, the feedback for you in terms of uh, improvement is that um, i gather that like me english is not your first language uh, so uh, to think in your own language and then translate into english can be a problem and a it's still difficult to learn in turn you can use a orthopedic language okay this yeah. is a dupitrans disease which is a uh, entrapment tendinopathy of first dorsal compartment okay so use use don't think and tell just mention the orthopedic language okay but otherwise your um, uh, knowledge is good and uh, anything no it should be uh, systematic you, you shouldn't use transaction and all this not transaction it's intersection Inter intersection yes intersection yes sir okay so uh, basically mm -hmm. that's one feedback secondly you need to practice i think you recently started uh, preparing isn't it yeah. you need to practice to get the flow okay it's not a big Uh, it is a easier thing to describe it in orthopedic terms rather than thinking and translating it and that orthopedic terms which people co call buzzwords can only come with practice yeah all yes, right yes. yeah thank you very much thank you yeah thank you uh, so that's fine man okay yeah. well done okay thank you so we go to next question so uh, islam yeah you are in a clinic and this lady she is uh, 48 years presents with the pain in her big toe right big toe what can you see so this is an ab radiograph of skeletally mature patient showing um narrowing um joint space in bilaterally in both um uh, and metatarsophalangeal joint mm -hmm. um 
What's your diagnosis? It is a hallux rigidus bilaterally, severe in the right side compared to the left. So she's symptomatic on the right side. Left side is not giving her any problem. What are you going to do? So, um, so I will assist the patient. Um, first of all, I will ask what is the occupation, what is the um, um, pain profile, uh, what, where is the pain, what make it, makes it better, what makes it worse, uh, any treatment underwent, uh, with a, to what extent it has improved the pain, whether underwent steroid injection or not. Uh, or any previous surgery, um, then I will assess patient clinically. I will assess the range of motion. I, I will uh, check passive range of motion to what extent patient can achieve dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of metatarsophalangeal joint. And then I will take it further passively. Uh, sorry, I, I, I will ask patient active range of motion. Then I will take it passively to check where, uh, what, the range of motion, whether the pain in the mid range or in the terminal, if it is in uh, terminal that that guides the treatment options to less um, lesser invasive compared to mid foot range or uh, mid foot uh, uh, pain, mid foot range of motion pain, mid range of motion pain. Sorry, uh, then I will assess the other joints, interphalangean joint as well as ferrous tarsal metatarsal, metatarsal joint. I will look for, I will assist and conclude my examination by neurovascular status as well as any history of diabetes, smoking, or any vascular problem. So when you say you did not make patient walk, but when you made her walk, she was trying to, yeah, I will, uh, trying to um, avoid the push off. Yeah. Okay? She was just trying to walk on a hill. Yeah, so it should be... Active heel raise difficult when you told her um, told her to yeah. it was painful. When you made a light and foot alignment was quite okay. You shared localized tenderness in the MTP joint. Range of motion was restricted and there was mid arc pain. She had a, a painless P uh, IP joint. Okay, distal neurovascular status was intact. No other problem. Ankle subtalar and uh, mid tarsal joints were supple and painless. So you think this is advanced arthritis? Yes. What are you going to do? What treatment are you going to do? So I will offer the patient, first of all, conservative options, including activity modification, um, rest, analgesia, um, physiotherapy, uh, orthotics, including um, any uh, metatarsal uh, orthosis. Um, um, so what is the orthosis used for this one? I think it might be offloading uh, plantar orthosis. Uh, Morton's uh, toe? Okay. What's that? Morton's toe. Yeah. And then uh, 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 if, if patient has uh, exhausted all of the conservative treatment, Probably I will offer the patient uh, also in the conservative a steroid injection. If exhausted all of the measures, I will offer the patient um, uh, 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 first metatarsal phalangeal joint fusion. However, um, if it's loading, patient uh, said that I I want to I want to I want a mobile joint. I don't want your physio. I will do so. That's why I would, if it's. So it's it's a bit controversial if it's mid range pain. However, I, I can do colectomy as a, a less invasive procedure. Uh, it tells you that her cousin had a joint replacement. Can you do one for her? Uh, so the literature showed that it is um, uh, uh, lot less outcomes compared to the arthrodesis. Um, it has a okay, sinusitis. So you are in theater, patient is consented, marked, and prepared. Tell me your MTP arthrodesis. I will do a, a, a dorsal incision over the first ray. I will uh, uh, um, cushion to be taken to a, a sensor um, um, halosus longus, and then uh, take it laterally, and then I will 
go straight to the inside the capsule will do colectomy, excise all of the osteophytes in the medial uh, aspect of the uh, medial eminence. Then I will few, I will um, uh, de de excise all of the uh, eroded articular surface, and then I will few the. Um, do you want the, to do reaming or no? Yes, I will do. There is a concentric reaming. Um, coupling uh, in a concentric manner which so you give. When we, to ream, you have to bit of open the joint, isn't it? Flex the joint. Yes. You find it very difficult to flex the joint. What are you going to do? Well, I will release um, the, so I will release the medial capsule as well as um, the You're abdomen. done, you release the capsule, but you cannot uh, flex it at all. It's difficult, totally difficult. What else you want to release? Adductor hallucis uh, tendon? No, no, no. Um, posterior capsule? I'm not sure to be honest. I don't know. Okay. So you really you ex inside the dorsal capsule and you cannot flex. You have to release collateral, isn't it? L release what? Collateral ligaments. Yeah. Okay. You did rimming and what position won't you fix and what implants you're going to use? I will use uh, a plate. Um, uh, it is, there is a, a few a fusion plate designed for this one, and I will put the position of the grade two in a ten degree dorsiflexion with a five to ten degree valgus. Then I will um, imbricate the medial capsule uh, over. You don't need to, you're not going medial, yeah, are you going medial? You're taking dorsal approach. I know yeah, you can go medial, but it's, the plane is not there. Yeah, the sometimes I... Accident. All right. Yeah. So what can be complications of this procedure? So complication start by non-union. Um, one of the problems, uh, extensor tendon rupture and neurovascular problems. Um, and What now will you damage? Which now? That, so the branch of the um, uh, student, uh, deep brain nerve, as well as uh, like the, the terminal branch of softness nerve, probably. But. Dorsal branch of dorsomedian nerve. Okay. Dorsal branch? Let's, yeah. Uh, so let's go to feedback. Islam, yeah. you're quite all right, man. You learned quite a lot. And I think you'll a little bit of, I think, rather than practice, I would suggest you need to do some courses here that, you know, that will help you more. Yeah. Um, but you got a very good knowledge base. You just need light bit of reasoning, okay? So, hallux rigidus is basically degenerative arthropathy of uh, MTP joint. So, it basically arthritis MTP joint it can be idiopathic or it can be trauma, multiple trauma, rheumatoid arthritis, or wearing um, pointed shoes, high heel shoes, etc. So most important thing, history. You say, ask him how did problem start, what, uh, how does it affect her with pain, function, and in this case, wearing shoes, okay? And uh, uh, what has been done? What are the risk factors? And you should make patient walk, please. And in this case, heel raise is important. Okay, then you see where is localized tenderness, assess that joint for uh, end of range pain or mid, mid, uh, mid, joint, mid arc pain, and assess the PIP joint also, IP joint also. And when you say you have to tell the grade, but it's mild, moderate, or advanced. Okay, and uh, a procedure you told me properly about chylectomy versus arthritis is so quite all right with that. Uh, so basically, you told approach denuding type of fixation, but when you are told me about denuding part and when, how you know, will you flex, you didn't know you have to release collaterals. Type of fixation, most people would put a screw and plate. So a interfract of screw and a, uh, a locking plate, locking row profile plate, all right? 
So you're quite all right. You done well. Okay. 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 Hi. All right. So this is your case. Um, so an eighty-nine year old lady. She complains of pain in the right hip and groin for one day. Denies any history of trauma. She has significant medical problems, as you can see. So she has heart, um, decompensated heart failure, AV stenosis, atrial fibrillation, hypertension, MI. She's not mobile to go peripheral respiratory disease, TIA. This operation was done back in November 1991. So describe what you see and proceed how you're going to manage this. So this X-ray of uh, pelvis showing both hips. On the right hip, there is a uh, total hip replacement, which on the X-ray uh, is dislocated. There is evidence of um, um, change in orientation of the establa component with potential um, lytic areas around the around the estabular cup with superior uh, and inferior. Uh, Lysis of the estabular wall. On the hip, it is a long stem process, uh, probably modular, um, with probably 22 millimeter head. There is evidence of lysis in the proximal femur. Um, it is an inadequate x ray because the whole length of the femur and the tip of the stem is not seen. Um, so I will, uh, um, on, the, on the lateral view, uh, the, the 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 orientation of cup is uh, tilted the st stem as well as the distal femur is intact um, okay so this picture that you see is the post of x-ray from 1991 yeah so th there, th there is evidence of the the, the sorry the, the current x-ray from this is the current x-ray. Yeah. This is the x-ray in 1991. Whoever did the procedure took yes. the x-ray post-operatively. Yeah. So. Anything um, you want to suggest what do you think it is? And so. You, you mentioned something about lysis here. Yeah. Do you think that is lysis as well? Osteolysis? Um, so it, it is an uh, un, uncemented cup. So um, I'm not sure whether it okay. is drill hole. I'm, I'm not sure. What about the stem? Is it cemented? Uncemented? So, so the st stem is also an un, uncemented stem. OK. Um, because um, I, I can't see any cement mantle around the distal part of the stem. So I guess it is an uncemented stem. So looking at the lateral view here, yeah, is the if, as if you say that the, the, the cup you think is in the correct position. So on, on the on the lateral view, there is, there is a retroversion of the cup. Okay, awesome. no worries. How how are you going to proceed now? So she's so, coming now with this person. Yes. So um, I I would uh, need for uh, I I would uh, take a proper history from the patient um, uh, regarding uh, how she progressed after her initial total hip replacement was she uh, completely asymptomatic? Uh, or she was completely asymptomatic. She yeah. was very happy with her uh, hip procedure that was done in nineteen ninety one. I would also ask the primary indication why. Uh, the hip replacement surgery was done. And, and that was a necrofemur fracture. Okay. Um, so if if it has been completely asymptomatic um, and from the from the history, she has got significant uh, past medical history and she has not been mobile. So I would ask her how how for how long she has not been mobile and what what is what, what does she use? For the last five years she has been really struggling with her medical problem. And recently she saw the cardiologist who said that you shouldn't be walking. So she is not walking anymore. 
Uh, so, so then I would ask her if if she if she is uh, immobile, uh, whether it is transferred to a wheelchair. If that that was, uh, she gets hoisted from bed to chair because of her. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I I will discuss the the X-ray with her uh, and um, uh, talk to her about the the uh, dislocation and uh, um, malalignment of the cup. Uh, I, I would uh, see if if she is fully compensated, if she can understand. She's fully uh, compensated, sir. MPS is 10 out of 10. Yes. So I, I, I will discuss her with, with her regarding the, the, the further plan, which uh, ideally if the cup was oriented, I, I could have tried an MUA and reduced the, the hip, which I think uh, in, in this particular scenario, it would not work because of the, the, the cup is uh, dislocated cup is um, uh, rotated and uh, it, it, it's also potentially um, loose. So I, I would tell her that the first uh, thing I would want to do would be to rule out any periprosthetic infection. I will ask her specifically if she has been having any. Uh, uh, so how would she tell you that she hasn't got a periprosthetic infection? So. If, if, she, if she had been uh, systemically unwell for the last uh, few weeks or months. She has been because of her heart and uh, chest problems. The hip yeah. was brilliant. She was very happy with the hip uh, procedure. Okay. So sometimes uh, if there is evidence of uh, any uh, swelling or redness around the, around the, uh, the operative site, uh, uh, the, as she's not mobilizing, um, uh, if, if there was any pain while, while hoisting out of the wheelchair? No, uh, there was no pain at all. It just became painful yes, yesterday. Sorry? So it became painful yesterday only. Before that, she was happy with her head. So, uh, but again, uh, I, uh, I would tell her that the, 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 the surgical procedure would depend on whether the, the prosthesis is infected or not. Um, um, so, Ideally, I would want to uh, uh, do some blood investigation to rule out uh, mainly full blood count, CRP, ESR, um, liver. Okay, liver so the blood investigations are all normal. Okay. So the ones that you have mentioned, FBC, CRP, ESR are normal. Okay. So I would tell her that uh, the next step to proceed would be to consider a surgery which would help her with her uh, current status and uh, current activity level. I would discuss her the possibility of having a stable hip with, by doing a revision hip surgery versus um, excision arthroplasty and uh, giving her pain relief and um, um, take it from there. Okay, so this is Saturday. You are the consultant on call. Do you deciding to take her to theater on Sunday for revision arthroplasty or excision arthroplasty? Uh, I, 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 would, uh, I would tell her that would be the basic basic principle of surgery, but I would discuss her in a local MDT, discuss with arthroplasty surgeon to get their opinion on how we proceed from there. And I would uh, tell her that uh, similar cases would be best managed by, the, by an arthroplasty arthroplasty surgeon so uh, but i would tell her the the the, the main principle would be um, to consider a revision surgery if 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 the, if she has a, had a, a if she wanted a stable hip for a transfer and for pain relief versus uh, excision arthroplasty any other management options apart from surgery um, would be to give traction to the limb for the for the pain um uh, in, investigate uh, with a ct scan to look if there is any any associated stabula fracture um and pain management okay all right so if you ask the anesthetist just to speed up things so that we can do this on monday and the anesthetist says that uh, she is not fit for um, anesthesia uh, yes uh, so I, I would tell her that um, um, uh, I will tell her that the, we, we have discussed her with the, with the anesthetic team, and uh, they would, uh, and as she is medically unstable, 
um, she would not be a fit candidate for surgery. So um, um, I, I will tell her that we would have to discuss her in a bigger MDT with the with the reconstruction as well as the the, the revision hip surgeons to get further management plan. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Uh, just one quick question. Uh, do you want to have a quick look again and think what could this be? Is it Sorry? a hip replacement? When, this is, the, when this is the post-op operation, uh, post-op images from 1991. Sorry, I didn't get your question. Okay, no worries, that's fine. So uh, how do you think that you have uh, um, dealt with this case? Um, I, I couldn't organize my thoughts. Um, I was um, going back and forth and... Um, yeah, um, that, is, that is right, Ajay. I think uh, you need a lot of, um, you know, preparation on this particular aspect of how you um, deal, because there will be cases which will be out of the box. So there might come a case which you never have seen in your life, for example. Yes. But what they are looking at in the exam is the higher order thinking that are you a safe surgeon and can you ma manage such a case that you haven't seen in your life in a safe manner? And that's the whole intention. So, um, and you approach any case with, you know, all those steps that is very well, um, you know, taught um, and agreed upon. So history, examination, and then do the necessary investigations and then if required you get into the uh, mdt involvement i try to give you some prompts here uh, i agree looking at this at first glance it does look like a thr or total hip replacement uh, but the prompt was here if this is the immediate post-op x-ray after the operation and you don't normally see that cup in that version isn't it on the lack so it's a bipolar hemiautoplasty. It's a very old stem, we, we call it Bateman. Uh, it's an American one, but uh, historical. As I said, it was done in 1991. Uh, the thing that really is, um, that I need to mention and, and, and give you feedback on is uh, not being able to identify the stem is not a big problem, but the approach needs to be saved. Uh, I think in your case, you went straight to a very major surgical options of revision arthroplasty or excision uh, arthroplasty. And uh, that you mentioned even before uh, mentioning the MDT. You later on did mention about MDT. However, that was as you, as you described back and forth uh, kind of uh, conversation. And then uh, when I mentioned the patient is not fit for haircut, according to the anesthetist, you still want to discuss with the higher MBT meeting for a major uh, reconstruction operation. So I, I gave you the prompt that can it be managed non-operatively. These cases, uh, the, the thought process here should be focused on patient-oriented well-being or patient care. We're not trying to solve the problem what we see on the x-ray. Yes, that is part of the patient management. However, it's not something that we see it is broken and we just need to sort that out and forget about other you know, aspects of the patient. So no, that's not the safe approach. The safe approach is you look a holistic picture of the patient and then make a decision of management plan that is the most suitable for that particular patient. And that would give the best outcome. And that, in this particular case, is a non-operative management because she's not fit for hair care. According to the anesthetist, she's not for, fit for anesthesia. If they try to anesthetize her, she will die. Yeah? yeah? So, so you gave, uh, put this particular case for two reasons. One, that implant is very old. And the second is that, you know, to give you the insight of how we manage patients rather than managing just the x-rays. Any anything not clear to you, or anything you want to ask for anybody? So, would it mean that then the patient would uh, have only pain management and um, 
Yes, so she's getting hoisted. Yeah. She does have a pain because this got dislocated. Mm -hmm. And had we had a time, we could have discussed further on the factors that would result in dislocation of a hemiarthroplasty or a total hip replacement, and that would have, you know, scored um, higher marks um, later on. But um, yes, because she is not fit for hip, so we're going to manage just the pain, basically, and there, and there would be non-operative management. Wonderful case. Wonderful case, Abid. Very good one. It's just uh, Ajay here. That's the higher order thinking they will be mm. looking at in the exam. Yeah. This you won't find it in the books. Yeah. And the book tells you hip failure, hip, you have need revision. Yeah? yeah. But here we have a real life scenario, higher order thinking, our consultants, they were looking at that you have a holistic approach. Yeah. Yeah. And that you will consult MDT, consult an easy test, yeah. Um, initially, and you listen to them, yeah. Well, you, there's no point consulting an easy test and then still things that tell you he's not fit, but you still want to do operation. You see what I mean? So yeah. safety, that will be safety thing, yeah. That will be safety. You, you unfortunately, if there is a, an easy telling you patient not fit, and you taking the patient to theater. No matter how well you do in that questions, then you will be deemed unsafe, yeah? So look at those all hints. They, these are all tick boxes in these questions. Um, you know, MDT approach to these patients, considering uh, patient by patient um, scenarios, safety. Um, you understand the complexity of matters, yeah? And... Uh, it's really um, just as simple as that sometimes, yeah? Uh, you don't have to, I know sometimes when you face with such a um, difficult case, your mind gets blocked. Yeah, and that's what you are here for. So we can just help you to, to unlock your brain and let your, your, unlock your method of, you know, analysis and thinking so that you can go through this in the exam. Just go back to the principles, yeah? Complex cases like this, always always mdt yeah always mdt comes first yeah. you don't need to jump into this at all yeah um and that's how you differentiate you as a consultant that you sit back uh, and and don't rush things yeah. you, you don't need to rush at all that's good good one good one well done Ajay. Yeah, importantly that some some candidates or some you know um, people think that not knowing each and every implant is a big problem. It's, yeah. it's not at all. I mean, I didn't know when I saw this case that uh, I, I expected it to be Bateman, but I wasn't sure till I got the op note. So not knowing the implant is not a problem and it is definitely not going to fail you in the exam, but it's the higher order thinking and your safe approach that matters. Okay, let's move. Now we... We're putting our clinicals hat on, okay, guys? So now these clinicals now in the exam are mainly um, scenario-based, simulated patient-based. There are no real patients, uh, at least until, you know, for uh, we know for this setting and next setting, at least. So we'll be all simulated, and, and this is how it's go. Over to you. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Thomas, so we go first one. So you're in clinic, you're doing your, your congratulations, you're uh, newly appointed up a limb consultant. Um, your GP sent you this 47 year old gen gentleman who, um, he's come because he's got problems with his hands, but he's also saying to you, he's got pain in his back and he gets headaches a lot. Um, and he also gets some pain in his chest, around both sides of his chest wall. Tell me, uh, how, how are you gonna approach this gentleman? Um, so first of all, I need to take uh, full history. Um, from him, um, asking a little bit more about his symptoms, when they started, um, whether there was any inciting event, any history of trauma or anything like that, which... Um, or in any those events. specific trauma as such, I mean, he does remember many years ago when he was a younger man, he had he did hurt, hurt himself playing rugby, but he never went to hospital as such. Um, but uh, it, it's been the last sort of, uh, sort of six, seven, uh, six months, he's noticed he's been getting uh, feels he's getting clumsy with his hands. I don't know whether there's any um, uh, specific position where he puts, you know, or any specific activities which makes uh, things worse. 
um, like using no, his arms. No specific care. activities makes things worse. Uh, he, he does, as I say, he, he has noted uh, this sort of clumsiness. And he on occasion gets this sort of back pain, particularly in his upper, uh, between his shoulder blades. He does feel a bit of back, he's been getting back pain recently. And he's always sort of had some headaches for the last couple of years on and off. Okay. I don't know about, know about any history in the neck at all. Any pain in the neck or, or stiffness? No, no pain specifically in the neck, mainly just between his shoulder blades. Okay. I want to know about any sort of colour changes or cold intolerance in the uh, in the hands at all? Um, no such cold. He, he, he does find he doesn't feel the cold as much as he used to. Okay. Um, and I'd want to know if this is bilateral or one, one more or the other. It's all bilateral. It's both hands. Okay. And whether he has any problems in his lower limbs at all? No, he doesn't know. He hasn't noticed any problems in his lower limbs. It's bad. They, they seem pretty much spared. Okay. I'd want to know if he has any medical uh, problems, any uh, sort of um, diagnoses of any sort of syndromic conditions or any. No, he's not diabetic. Um, he doesn't have any medical history. Um, he works as a he works as a builder. As I say, in the past he did play rugby, um, but no, nothing specific. Uh, sort of nothing that stands out. Um, okay. Um, and whether he has any neurological symptoms in the limb, any pins and needles, uh, sensory changes. Um, how, how are you going to be able to describe that to you? How would you ask him specifically? I'd ask him whether he has pins and needles in his hand or whether they feel um, different. He does get some pins and needles in his hand. He also gets some pins and needles going into his armpits. Okay. Mainly on one side, on, on his right side, less so on his left side. Okay. Fine. Um, Okay, I'd like to move on to examine him. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd want to start by examining his neck, looking at his neck, range of movement, um, just, and seeing if this uh, exacerbates any um, any of the symptoms. Um, okay, yeah, it doesn't exacerbate as such. I mean, when you look at his back, you notice that. You notice that. Okay, so um, on the right side, uh, his uh, his scapula seems higher than the uh, higher than the left. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so um, I'd want to uh, confirm that this is uh, whether this is a smaller scapula than the left, or and um, sort of higher, or whether this is scapula. It could be scapula winging. It's not clear from the full. Uh, what about his? What about his back? Mm -hmm. Um, I can also see scoliosis. Okay. Um, Would that be the reason why he has all this slightly more prominent scapula? Okay, yeah. So it looks like a right-sided sort of um, uh, thoracic mm -hmm. curve on, on, this, uh, on this image. Okay. Um, now, um, so in terms of, so you've seen the idea of this. So what, what, what might, how might you look for a tone, let's say? So to look for tone, I would just ask him to relax uh, his arms and sort of do it, sort of shaking, shaking hands and pro whilst mm -hmm. pro supination, uh, pro yeah. supinating the arm. Okay, so when you're doing his toe, you notice he's got slightly increased tone in his upper, in his upper limb. Okay. A normal, it feels like normal tone in his, in his lower limb. Okay. Um, so I also want to examine the reflexes, such as the Hoffman's reflex, and look for any. Sort of, uh, uh, in terms of Hoffman's reflex, but you notice he has quite brisk reflexes in his upper limb, less so in his uh, in his lower limb. Okay, I want to examine to see if he's got any sensory level, and I want to examine his myotomes. Okay, he's got pretty good strength in his lower legs, um, um, but you do notice there is a subtle weakness. Um, plus three, three and a half out of five on power in his in his arms compared with what you would expect um, compared with his lower limbs. Uh, I also want to examine the um, uh, vascular uh, status of his um, arms, feeling the pulses and doing... Um, well, good, good pulses, no, no problems with pulses. Okay, and I'd also a uh, dynamic test to look for any thoracic uh, outlet type syndromes. No, 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 no evidence of that. Okay. okay. And I also would like to examine for uh, long track signs in the lower limbs, so doing a Romberg's test. Um, examining his uh, for any clonus in the ankles. 
Um, I say, no, he's got, he's mainly, he's got increased plasticity in his upper limbs. So, um, his long track sizing to be fine. Okay, fine. So um, just to summarise, this gentleman's got bilateral uh, upper limb um, symptoms and back pain with a scoliosis and an upper motor neuron picture. Um, so I'd like to get, uh, first of all, x-rays. Uh, What's your differential? So my differential is, is, is probably, a, seems to be a spinal cause. You may have um, some sort of um, um, intraspinal lesions like a syrinx um, or cervical myelopathy. Um, yeah. That's okay. It. So we're investigating, you get an x-ray, it doesn't really show you very much. So we'll get an x-ray, I'll get an MRI scan of the whole spine. Okay. So as if by magic, you get your MRI scan. Okay. So this does show a cervical spine syrinx, um, uh, evidenced by high signal within the um, cervical spine extending from uh, C4 level Ooh. to as distally as I can see. What is a syrinx? So syrinx is a fluid um, uh, filled uh, lesion within the uh, spinal cord. Okay. And what might you expect to see in a syrinx in terms of features? Uh, clinical features in a patient, you mean? Yes. Uh, yeah. In, in yeah. The um, so it might cause an upper motor neuron type picture. Yeah. Um, More like central cord, isn't it? Yeah. Where the upper limb is. So upper limb is, limb is dead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in terms of your management for this gentleman, what might you? What what, what sort of options do you think you're going to do? What might you do? Because obviously he's worried because he's only 47. Yeah, I'd want to discuss this with a, a, a spinal surgeon, probably a neuro, neurosurgical um, spinal surgeon. Um, and um, yeah, uh, th th there doesn't seem to be any uh, extrinsic compression on the spinal cord. Um, looking at these MRI slices, but I'd like to see the rest of the Spine to see if there's any area of, of compression which can be uh, dealt with surgically. Okay. Um, well, from your understanding, what's the main state of management with these with these patients? Um, uh, conservative management. Yeah, it's mainly observation. Yeah. But in terms of surgical interventions, what might you go down? What route might you go down? Um, I'm not sure whether the, whether it's possible to decompress the syrinx but um, uh, that's something I've no experience of presumably that would be uh, done by yeah. a neurosurgeon if, if possible. If... Yeah so generally it yeah so uh, overall Thomas that was a good answer um, you went for it very systematic sorry I know you'd have a lot more time in the world of being apologies and um, we're obviously doing this within a very constrained space of time but yeah so but with the history it focus uh, do it you have to sort of Key thing is a focused history or 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 a sort of a history to try and elicit your thing. So yes, do go for you want to know about your um, upper upper motor neuron lesions because he's talking about bilateral symptoms. So you're quite right. You have to have in the back of your mind um, uh, long track signs. Um, I, I was trying with sort of talking about upper limb, lower limb being spared. I was hoping to 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 get you thinking about something more like a central cord style picture. But yeah, but uh, from the differentials, I was happy you got that right. Um, you, you're quite good. Um, you, you spot, yeah, that was one of your differentials. Admittedly, I would probably put it a little bit lower down normally when you have a, a more standard question, for example. But that was overall, that was good. Um, but yeah, so it can come up, I'm afraid, guys, in the exam, because it is something that is within our, within our sort of, uh, we will get them in our clinics on occasions when we have um, people who have been referred to us with bilateral hand symptoms and we think it's coming from the neck. And we get an MRI scan, and lo and behold, it is it is a cervical myelia or syrinx. Um, yes, so I did try and give you a clue as well at the beginning. I thought we were doing an upper limb thing. <laughs> no, spines come to the upper limb. All oh, right, okay, yeah, fair so, enough. Yeah. So uh, spines will come on the upper limb, um, and so central cord syndrome, spines, anything on the spines will be upper limb because uh, no one then they may talk about this disease, scoliosis. Um, this is a good one because, as I say, 80%, up to 80% of people with syrinx will have some form of scoliosis. Okay. And as, as a few of us a quarter will, but uh, some papers say up to 80%. Okay.
So, uh, but as I say, it, it's one of those ones where, but I was, I, you had a good, you had a bit of a higher order thinking, a good approach. And so you got that diagnosis. To be honest, this is a tough one. So to be getting diagnosis is part of, it's your approach you're getting your marks for in the clinical in this situation. Okay, thank you. Good. So I have a question. Does it give the same sim, uh, similar symptoms of cervical myelopathy or, or it doesn't give the same symptoms? Cervical myelopathy, we, we, you, so uh, the key here is um, the lower limb is spared, typically. So hence, sort of central cord style syndrome. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, do, it, it depends whether it, it does depend on the position of the syrinx, but in, in this situation, it was a, it was they were sparing the lower limb. Okay, which is what I was hoping to sort of get get across. But um, and then, well, key thing, key thing as well, just double check with things. So it is result from a lesion partially obstructing CSF fluid. So that injury in his rugby may be may have caused it. I don't know, but it was one of those ones where you can have one of the potential causes can be um, of that. Okay. And how is spinal right. fusion improve it or as an option? Spinal fusion is a, is a situation where, as I say, I'm, you would have to talk to the neurosurgeons about it. They tend to deal with this more than we do. But from my understanding, they would decompress the back. So they almost, even though, even though the lamina are fine, they almost take the back off and you have to fuse it to give it stability. Because what's happening is as the fluid builds up, it presses on the nerves. You can try decompressing it, but you're going more likely going to cause issues to the spinal cord, aren't you? Sticking your needle into that to take, take the fluid off. Thank you. All right. Okay, um, so next. Thank you. Okay, so the next one is another hip. Okay, so who's up next? Uh, Hi. Hello. Right, so remember with the FRCS, the key is in the question. All right, so here we've got a 21 year old, she's a dancer. And she's got hip pain, but she also complains of it popping and snapping. So what's going through your mind? So in a young patient like that, it, it was more like a, a, a soft tissue uh, labral uh, sort of a pathology I'd be looking uh, or thinking about. So I will take the history from this patient mm -hmm. uh, regarding um, um, the symptoms. Um, when do they come up? For how long uh, she's had this, uh, any trauma associated with the initiation of these symptoms? And um, um, is this uh, uh, these symptoms are with the daily activity or doing um, just the uh, with the uh, dancing or any impact exercises she tends to have? So she's them. had them for about three months, and initially they were only when she was dancing, but now they're when she tries to go for a run or she goes to the gym, she notices it. Okay, and uh, where does she point to uh, towards uh, the pain? So, so she points around the uh, groin area. Okay, and is she taking painkillers for that? No, she's not. So it's not affecting her activity. It's more to do with the uh, popping sensation and off yeah. and on. Okay, and is she having these symptoms of popping, uh, it, it, turning in bed as well, or just while walking? No, she's only noticed it when she's doing something active. Okay, so uh, the the just three, prior to three months, she was perfectly fine, no symptoms whatsoever. No, she didn't notice anything before then. Okay, and uh, she's been fit and well, healthy. Yep. Never had any trouble with her hips in the past as no. a child. No. Nope. Okay. All right. So I would examine her now, um, mm -hmm. and uh, in examination, I would like to see her walk, uh, see the gait. I presume it would be a normal gait because uh, it's just the popping sensation she's complaining of. Then I would do the Trendelenburg test to see uh, uh, if it starts positive or not. Uh, then I would um, make her uh, 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 sit at the edge of the bed and I will ask her to uh, lift the knee up to stress the iliosos uh, uh, to see if there's any impingement of the iliosos. Okay, so that's very painful for her. All right, okay. That's painful, and I'll make her lie on the bed, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, then I would uh, 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 generally have a look of any obvious limb length discrepancy. Uh, I would have noticed that in the gait as well, but uh, then I would. Uh, uh, um, so I didn't ask which hip was it—is bilaterally or just one side? It's just one side, but it doesn't matter which okay. side it is in this case. So, but then I would uh, do the range of movement, see how much flexion she has got. 
Uh, and, okay, uh, so when you do that, when you flex her up and a little bit of external rotation, you hear a snapping noise. Okay, there's reflection and adduction or flexion and abduction. So we sort of a... Um, it, the adduction doesn't really bother her. It's more the um, external rotation. Okay, fine. So, um, and then um, I would just take uh, uh, with her leg on the bed, I would roll her leg to see internal external rotation and full extension of her hip and her knee, if that causes any uh, problem or not. Um, not particularly, not when you passively do it like that, no. Okay, all right. Um, so what are you thinking? So uh, th this seems to be uh, more like a, either a iliosos uh, uh, impingement uh, or a, a labral pathology. The labral pathology would, my, would be my first uh, uh, differential there. And, uh, okay. And uh, then I would, uh, after this, I will complete my examination with just a uh, neurovascular examination of the lower limb and examine screen yep. the spine as well. Then I would uh, allow for investigation, a radiologic investigation in the form of a plain radiograph to see if there is any dysplasia or anything like that. I can see in this young lady, any uh, evidence of any dysplastic hips, uh, which may be the cause of uh, her uh, uh, labral pathology. As okay. Well. So <clears throat> have you heard of a snapping hip? No. Okay. All right. Well, we'll come on to that in a second. So it's either an external snapping hip or an internal snapping hip, or it can be intraarticular pathology. So besides labral pathology, is there another condition that could maybe give you that sensation inside the joint? Not, it's usually not in the hip, it's usually in the knee or the ankle, but you can get it any joint, any synovial joint in the body. Synovial chondromatosis. Oh, okay. okay, that's not what she has, but that's one of our differentials. All right, let's have a look. So the two main types are the external snapping hip and the internal snapping hip. So the external is when the um, ITB slides over the GT and it's said that you can see that happening. So when you examine them, if you put your hand over the GT, it stops it sliding. The internal one is, as you correctly identified, is the iliopsoas tendon, which slides um, around the femoral head over the iliopectinal ridge. It can, you can have an exostosis of the lesser troch or the iliopsoas bursa, which is causing that. And the other reason that you can have an internal snapping hip is if you've had a joint replacement, you've got some impingement there. Um, so history and examination, exacerbate activity, so any locking might indicate intra-articular pathology like synovial chondromatosis. And this is the thing. So an external snapping hip, you can see it. And the internal snapping hip, you can hear it. That's why I said when you flex a leg, you hear a snap. Um, and this is, so with the external, you can do Ober's test looking for tightness of the tensor fascia lata. Um, with the internal, let me just move that out of the way because you probably can't see it. Um, <clears throat> there we go. So if you move from a flexed and externally rotated position to an extended and internally rotated position, that's when they get the snapping sensation. Um, so what else we got? So imaging. So the x-rays are usually normal unless you've got synovial chondromatosis. You can do an ultrasound scan. It's dynamic, it's snapping band. And the advantage is if you've got good sonographers um, or radiologists, you might be able to do an injection um, into the trochanteric bursa, the alias of tendon or intra-articular. And I think, I've, I think we sometimes do that then we've we've got someone that's post-op post -op hip replacement and they're having iliopsoas type impingement. You can do an ultrasound guided injection to see if that relieves the symptoms. Um, so an MRI scan might show intraarticular pathology like a labral tear or synovial chondromatosis, and it might show an inflamed bursa. Um, the other one that I've put in for completeness is iliopsoas bursography. 
less common, basically it's fluoroscopy and contrast, and then you can do a therapeutic injection. Management. Usually it's painless and they don't need any treatment. It's just annoying. Uh, you can act activity modification. Um, if it's acute, under six months of painful internal and external. Physiotherapy, if it's persistent and painful and interfering with the ADLs. And operative, you can do a Z-plasty of the ITB. You can release the eyeless service tendon. If it's you find some intra-articular pathology, you can do a hip arthroscopy with removal of the loose bodies or labeled debridement and repair. So any questions about that one? No, thank you. No? All right, good. Very good.